Hey guys, how's it going? Before I get into the reviews, I have one thing to say to you guys. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the stuff that I want to do on this channel, and one of the things that I thought would be really cool to do, um, uh, I kind of want your guys' opinions on it, um, it's like, kind of something like what Comic Pop does with their back issues, but I would probably do like a podcast thing where I get a group of my friends together who don't read comic books and I explain a certain storyline, graphic novel, whatever, to them in kind of that kind of style, but obviously I would change a lot of stuff around to have it not not be the same as that but have it be have it be like something like that but in my own style let me know in the let me know in the comment in the comments if you want to see something like that or if you just want to see like me do any sort of podcast cuz honestly any anything like that is where i where i want to take this channel in the future i want to do more do more stuff like that do more live stuff and do yeah just expand and everything but anyway if you saw my video a few days ago i went through what books i bought on that day i've read them and today i will share my thoughts about them in ranking them in order of what I enjoyed least to what I enjoyed most. This week wasn't really a great week, it didn't have a standout and it didn't really have a book that I would have... The clear book that I would have put at the bottom was clear from the get-go and the book that I wanted to put at the top was not. Um, so yeah, probably because there was no Venom this week probably why but the amazing spider-man issue three um yeah this book is this book was slow really slow and kind of boring the problems are the same as the last issue there's too many jokes it's like one on each panel um and there's just nothing really that happens. Um, it's basically just explaining why Peter Parker and Spider-Man are two separate people now. Why they're not the same anymore. And explaining what that, what the device that split the two has done to them. It's... It's fine, but it's it's just a explanation issue. It's not really. It's really slow, and they could what they summed up in the entirety of this issue could have been summed up in one page. Next up is the Cable and Deadpool Annual Number One. Um. Yeah, it was. This was fine, really. Um, I think half of this was because I read it when I was like half asleep, and I I was tired whilst reading this, and this didn't help because it's all it's all very like time travelly and confusing, and the plot really isn't isn't that great. So there's this this villain that has a crush on this time traveller. Um, and the villain goes to Deadpool to, and basically says, this time traveller is your mum, I can reconnect you with your mum if you help me. Um, and so Deadpool's fool enough to go and, go and do this, and they find out that the, this, this guy is a bad guy. Cable joins in, and the uh, time travelly stuff ensues. Um not really much to talk about and 
despite everything that happens, there's not really much of a story here, and that's kind of the problem. But it is... It's still not completely worthless, but it is kind of just a fluff annual. And as far as fluff annuals are concerned, this is one of the worser ones. Next up, Hunt for Wolverine, the Adamantium Agenda. For once, it's not at the bottom. Still doesn't mean it's great. Um, they explain a lot of things in this issue. The fight that they have at the at the end with Mr. Sinister is kind of short. And one thing that I did like is that all during this, um, Luke Cage and Jessica Jones have had to have a babysitter. And they chose Iron Fist. That was pretty cool. Um, they do, like, say at the end that Laura Kinney's mum... That Laura Kinney isn't actually, like, a biological clone. She's actually the proper daughter of Logan and um, this other Kinney woman. Um, but yeah, it's fine. It does kind of... The, the payoff at the end of this is still a bit stupid because it's... It's a character discovery of something that really doesn't change anything. Oh, you know the person that raised you for all, all this time? Actually, your real parent. It's not really much of a, a discovery. Uh, you know, it's fine. It's not, it's not going to hurt anyone. So, yeah. Captain America number two. It is so good to have a decent Captain America story and something that I can actually get interested in and get intrigued in. Um, this is a fairly quick read. The first issue was a lot better than this, but this is by no means bad. This is very good. Um, it's basically Captain America versus the nukes and he's on the run and he's trying to atone for his sins during Secret Empire and it's and as far as an apology for Secret Empire, this is quite a good one. This is a very good one. Um, yeah, it's it's worth a read if you're not if you're not reading Captain America, it's um it's a good read and it's written by Tanahisi Coates who who is showing me that he is a very talented writer. I don't care about stuff that he said, what he said on Twitter. He's writing a damn good Captain America, and that's that's what I can credit him for. Tony Stark, Iron Man, number three. This is very much a testament to what I said during my haul video. Um, it's much more of a side character driven book, and it's, heck, it's, it's more of a Jocasta book, if anything. Like, this whole story arc is meant to be based around the controller um, infiltrating Stark Industries or Stark Unlimited. Um, that's really not what, not what they've pushed to the forefront. At the forefront of this story is Jocasta and Jocasta wanting to be a... Jocasta wanting to be human and wanting to feel human. And at the end of this issue, we get something that's quite sad, really. Um, throughout this issue, there's kind of a back and forth between Jocasta and Machine Man. Jocasta wants Tony Stark to build this, like, escape thing that is really like um, Ready Player One-ish. It's almost practically the same thing. It's very Ready Player One, Westworld. You go in and it's a it's a virtual reality game. Um, Jocasta goes in as Iron Man, and of course Tony Stark is is Doctor Strange, 
because he always has to be the most powerful and the master of something. Um, but he very much takes a backseat, and it's very much Jocasta, Jocasta's book. Machine Man infiltrates this escape, and there's a, a little bit of a fight, and we find out that the controller has been, like, weeding his way through things, but this is something that definitely would have happened if, even if the controller wasn't there, kind of thing. And by the end of the issue, um, Jocasta and Machine Man have a fight, they have a row, and Jocasta leaves and goes back into the escape. Um, Tony Stark does tell Jocasta what is going on with him, what is happening to his body, that his body is decaying, and that he he is fearing that he doesn't have a soul anymore. Um, but whilst this is happening, um, Jocasta doesn't really have a place to go back to, so she goes back into the escape and she just stays in there. It's a very, very sad ending to a very thought-provoking book, and it's and this is this is probably one of the most intriguing um, books to come out of um, to come out of uh, Marvel Fresh Start. It is. By far one of the best things I've I've seen Dan Slott write in a long time, and very very entertaining. And it's a it's a damn good read. It's a damn good book, and it's very. It reminds me a lot of Demon in a Bowl. Reminds me a lot of Demon in a Bowl, where all these storylines, the kind of main storyline or the main, where storylines are very much pushed to the back. And it's it's a lot of like one and done stories with a main like a main storyline, a main link at the at the center of it all. Next up is Daredevil, issue number six hundred and six. This is the start of a new story arc where Daredevil will be going up against Mike Murdoch. Right. But that doesn't really happen until, like, the end of the book. They don't meet until the end of the book. Um, most of this book is a fight between Daredevil and Hammerhead. Hammerhead has, um, infiltrate, is um, robbing a bank, he's using explosives, and most of his... Most of his... Um, like henchmen, their guns aren't actually firing um, bullets; they're firing nails, and that's kind of a that's a cool thing. That's a cool gimmick that I'd I'd like them to go further with further with with Hammerhead. Um, yeah, it's basically just a cool action-filled book. I was very skeptical about the art. Didn't annoy me as much as I thought it would. Still very... Still not my cup of tea, but I can get past it. Um, in the background, they are still trying to take down Wilson Fisk as well. They are still trying to take down Mayor Fisk. And Daredevil brings in Frank McGee, who brings in Cypher and Rita. Um... Reader is a very interesting character to have in a Daredevil book because they are practically because they are practically the same character. They're both blind. They're both very good at martial arts. It's just Reader has the ability to read stuff and make anything that he reads appear and become real. Only only works three times a day, and blah blah blah. But it's a very interesting way to to have the book. My only fear is that there are still so many storylines happening at once that it may become confusing and that they may not have 
the time in the in the story arc to get everything done because I don't know how long this Mike Murdoch story arc is going to go on for and I don't know how long they have until they go back to Dead or number one again or if it even goes back to number one. Doctor Strange number four. This is the best issue of Doctor Strange so far because it's it's very much focusing on why Doctor Strange lost his powers in the first place and what Doctor Strange is and who he is and what he stands for and why he uses his powers and why he is the Sorcerer Supreme. Um, he is, we start off in the middle of a fight with these, um, with these, like, fluorescent neon characters, aliens, and they have, they have, um, kidnapped a dwarf who can, like, turn magic into weapons, and they, and they think... He might be u he might be useful. Also, he's been kidnapped, and oh, how how tough can these can these guys be? They get their asses handed to them. Um, it gets to the point where this character has to like trade herself off for the dwarf and literally like put literally send this dwarf and Doctor Strange onto another planet. And she goes back with the aliens. Um, we find out that these aliens have plans for Earth. Which, again, I don't like. Because every alien that Doctor Strange has come across in this book, apart from his, apart from his um, partner, have been... Have always had plans for Earth, or always wanted to um, infiltrate Earth. It's never been like, oh, we just want to, we just want to kill Doctor Strange. It's always like, oh, we must, we must go back to Earth. The whole point of this storyline is to get away from Earth and to focus more on Doctor Strange as a character. But apart from that, the rest, the rest of this book is. Fine. It is. It's more than fine. It's brilliant, actually. Um, it's basically this dwarf asks Doctor Strange, "Why you? Why?" He's also like, "Why have you been so hot-headed lately? Why do you think you lost your magic? Magic is not supposed to be used for conflict or war. It is meant for. It's also not meant for anger." To be able to to use your magic, to be able to use your magic at the full extent that you, to be able to like get it back to where it was, he has to lose these negative emotions. So this dwarf then takes him back to his forge, and that's where the issue ends. It's. I think the story arc is going to be very good if they don't do the same thing that they did with the last story arc where they cut it off short and they rushed everything. If this doesn't rush everything, so if this doesn't rush everything, then I think I think they've got a winner on their hands because the whole idea of why Doctor Strange lost his powers in the first place is a very, very interesting way to go. And my pick of the week, best book I read this week, Fantastic Four, number one. And it's not even because of the main story. The main story is good. The artwork as well by Sarah Bicelli. I don't know it. I don't know whether I love it or if I hate it. It's very simplistic, but also very bright and colourful. It works so well for the for the Fantastic Four. Um, it's basically an extension 
of the Marvel 2-in-1 with Reed and Sue coming back right at the end. Um, it's ba basically Johnny Storm is still in a deep state of depression because he's lost his sister and his brother-in-law and his niece and nephew and Ben Grimm is trying to make a new family with Alicia Masters he proposes and then asks Johnny to be his best man this makes Johnny this makes Johnny really upset because the only person that can be Ben Grimm's best man in his eyes is Reed and it's at this moment when Reed and Sue put a four in the sky and announce that they they're coming back and when we see them on this like floating asteroid just before they're about to go to earth they look they look a little worse for wear and it looks like the next issue is going to explain why why and where they've been and why and what's happened to them Um, mostly the reason why this is my pick of the week is the backup story with Doom. Um, basically showing that he's not. He's going back to being a villain, but he's going back to being a villain on his terms. It's... It's very much a very Doom-like thing to do. And... The artwork for that backup story is so good. <laughs> Man, it's very, like, Terry Dodson-ish. I'm going to show you a page. Because they give... It's about this, this group that follows Doom. And they... They kind of give him back his, like, his mask. And he says... I've I've had the power of a god. I've played hero. I just want to be left alone. And then they they basically tell him, no, we we Latvia, or Latveria, doesn't need a coward. It needs a king that can rise up and can take control. And so doom puts the mask back on, puts the cloak back on, and he is back. He is back to being the good old Doom we all know and love. None of this Iron Man shit. He's back to being just straight cut Doom. And it's, it's a good way of showing he may be a villain, he may treat his people like shit, but they will f but his followers will follow him to the letter. There's also there's also a funny little backup story with Impossible Man where he's like, What? What? Fantastic Four? Fantastic Four number one and they don't even bring back Reed and Sue? What? And he's like And he's like, What? They'll be back in the next issue. Well, I guess that's fine. I guess that's, I guess that's like the fan reaction of of this. Like they're not back in the they're not back in the first issue. It's not, it's not worth it. Um, but no, it's a very good first issue for Fantastic Four, and what I want to see from the re uh, from this first story arc is that there's kind of a lot of it needs to answer a lot of questions and it needs to show what happened in the last two years or three years that they've been away and why Ben and Johnny didn't go with them why they were sent back to earth it needs to tell that side it doesn't need a villain it doesn't need a fancy um 
It doesn't need a big villain. It doesn't need Doom to come back and and start World War Three. It doesn't need a big action set piece. It just needs to answer the questions. And that's what Dan Slott is doing. It's answering questions. And that's why it's my pick of the week. So those... Those are all the books that I read this week. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of these books. And specifically what you thought of Fantastic Four number one. Because everyone read it. I'm pretty sure everyone read it. Right? Right? Well, everyone that reads comic books anyway. Um, but yeah. If you like this video, give it a like. Comment. Subscribe. Check out all the links in the description below to my Patreon, my Twitter, my Instagram, and I will see you guys in the next video. Until then, to all I want, peace.